scripture hymn books. We're going to open up today a little differently. We're going to open up with a hymn. It's uh, number 493. Y'all can sing it right along with us. I am on the battlefield for the Lord. All right. Here we go. I'm on the battlefield. Let's sing it. I am on the battlefield for my Lord. I am on the battlefield. I am on the battlefield for my Lord. And I promised him that I, and I promised him that I, I will serve him till I die. Serve him till I die. I am on. I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. Right, let's do the first verse. I was alone and I, and I was a sinner too. And I heard the voice saying, There's work to do. I took my master's hand and I joined the Christian band. I am on. Right, let's go to the course. I am on the battlefield. For my Lord, I am on the battlefield. I promised him that I, I, I would serve him, serve him till I die. I am on the battlefield. For my Lord, I left my friends and kindred. I left my friends and kindred bound for the promised land. The grace of God upon me, and the Bible in my hand, in distant lands, distant lands of trial, crying sinners come to God. I am on the battlefield. Let's take it to G. I am on the battlefield for my Lord. I am on the battlefield. I promised him that I, I will serve him. I am on the battlefield. Our last verse. Now, when I met my Savior, I met my Savior. I met him with a smile. He healed my wounded spirit. Wounded spirit. And on me as a child. Points my soul to place. I am on the battlefield. All right, let's sing this chorus together one more time. I am on the battlefield. I am on the battlefield for my Lord. I am on the battlefield. And I promise him that I, I will serve him. Thank God for one of those old hymns. I'm on the battlefield for the Lord. Amen. Let's give God another hand clap of praise as we join hands and hearts preparing to come to the altar. For those who would like to come to the altar, we invite you to come. You can stand where you are. You can kneel where you are. But let's begin to pray. Amen. It's prayer time. Amen. I'm a strong believer in the power of prayer. All right. Don't be afraid to come. Amen. Amen. Don't be afraid to kneel. We're here to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Thank you, Lord. 
those issues, those trials, those troubles, those tribulations. Take them to the Lord and leave them there. God is able. Amen. Most holy and all wise God, our Father. Father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. The God of creation and the God of our salvation. We humble ourselves before you. For it is in you that we live, we move, and we have our being. It's because of you, God, that we've been able to assemble this morning and to acknowledge you, God, for who you really are. We acknowledge the fact that, God, it was you that touched us with the finger of love this morning. We turned over from our bedsides. God, we recognize that we have much to be thankful for, not only for waking us up, but from having a bedside to turn over from, to have shelter over our heads and a reasonable portion of our health and strength to have food to eat at our discretion, to have more clothing than we could wear, transportation across dangerous streets and highways, jobs, transportation, and employment and retirement. and Just so many different ways you have provided for us. So often, God, we're guilty of taking for granted your kindness. We fail to realize, God, that we don't deserve anything that you've done. But every day from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, God, you continually bless us and shower us with your goodness. So, God, I just believe that from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, we ought to play, praise and bless your name. We ought to express our gratitude. Every time we think of your goodness, God, let us be mindful to say thank you. When we look back over our lives and we remember from whence you brought us, those dark days that we found ourselves in, when we didn't even have a personal relationship with you and yet we cried out and you heard our voice and you delivered us. More often than we would like to admit, God, we lied to you on numerous occasions. For we said, God, if you get us out, out of this one, God, we promise we won't do it again. But after you delivered us, we found ourselves right back in those situations again. And then we cried out unto the Lord and you heard us again. And you brought us out with a mighty strong hand. God, you've been good to us. Not only since we've been saved, but even prior to our salvation. And I want to thank you this morning. We could have been dead, sleeping in our graves, long before we got saved. But you spoke and made death behave. God, we want to say thank you today. Life could have turned out differently for us. We were headed down a path of destruction. And yet, God, you sent an angel on our behalf put a detour in our path and caused us to turn right when we were going left. And here we are today in this your house among your people and we come to say thank you. We take no credit, God, for the goodness that we experience on a day-to-day -day basis. For we realize if it had not been for the Lord on our side, if it had not been for you watching over us, if it had not been for your abundant provision, if you had not protected us from the wiles of the devil, God, we wouldn't be here today. But now that we're here today, we're not going to come in vain, but we're going to come to say thank you. We've come to bless your name. We've come to praise your name. We've come to honor your name. We've come to glorify your name. we come to worship you in spirit and in truth. And now, God, as we have come by faith, we assemble here at this altar. We're standing, God, in these pews. And we're looking to you, God, for an answer. Somebody right now that's struggling. Somebody right now that's spiritually depleted. Somebody right now that's having problems in their home. Somebody is struggling with their finances. Somebody has health issues. Somebody's got an issue with their children, with their parents, with their jobs, with their situation. But God, we know that you're able to deal with every situation. So God, you said if we pray, we would receive what we pray for if we believe we received it even before you showed it. 
So God, we stand in agreement today with every one of your saints, with every one of these children of yours, for those who are believing for a miracle in their lives. We stand with them and we proclaim God deliverance in the name of Jesus. Somebody has been held captive with a stronghold. Satan has blinded somebody. But in the name of Jesus, we declare them to be loose this morning and free from the bondage of sin. Free from that destructive lifestyle. Free from those captivities and those chains that have held them bound. Free in their minds. Free to hold their head up. Free to walk up right before you. Free to live out your word. We declare it right now. Every demonic force, every evil spirit that has come into this house, it does not have any place here. It is not welcome here. And in the name of Jesus, we cast it out right now and we declare it in the name of Jesus that this is the day that the Lord has made and we're gonna rejoice and be glad in it. So we praise you, God. Purge us today. Wash us. Cleanse us. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Fill us with your word. Renew us. Regenerate us. Revive us again. And we'll be careful to give you the praise. We'll give you all the honor. And we give you all the glory. And we declare it as done. And we receive it as done. In the name of Jesus, we will not go back and pretend we're still looking for it. It's already done. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Give somebody a hug and say, it's already done. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you this morning. Praise God. I believe in the power of prayer. Be free from those spirit of depression. The downward spirit. God has given you joy today. Amen. Praise God, praise God. It's good to fellowship in the house of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus.
any first time visitors, would you please stand? How many first time visitors, would you please stand? All right, everyone is at home, so, and being that you are at home, you know how to make your own self comfortable and welcome and ready to serve. We do want to welcome all of those who are streaming live and then those who will join us via radio. So at this time, we want to give each and every one of our own selves a hand clap of love and a hand clap of welcome. <laughs> Next Sunday is Red Dress Sunday. So on behalf of the, um, this is the health ministry, we want to invite everyone to wear red on next Sunday. Amen. All right, it's offering time. If you need an envelope, would you raise your hand, please? If you need an envelope, would you raise your hand? It's just time to give back what God has so freely given us. Key word being freely. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we come before you right now to say once again, thank you. We thank you, God, that you have given us provisions for all during this week. We thank you, God, for the way that you just give us what we stand in need of right when we need it, day by day. Because, Father God, you know. We thank you for the way that you show up in ways that we don't expect. We thank you, Father God, that when we are given those provisions that we have to know and just look up and say thank you, for we know that it came from nobody but you. And now, God, as we give back, we just ask that you would just bless this offering. May it be used for the upbuilding of your kingdom, and then all things be done decent and in order that you get the glory. We ask that you would bless those who gave, bless those who had not to give, and then we ask that you would just change the hearts of those who had to give but gave not. And in all things, we give you praise, we give you honor, and we give you the glory. And the church says, amen. amen. Well, I ask that everyone would please stand and we'll start from the rear. Thank you. What he's done for me. What he's done for me. I never will. I never shall forget. Never shall forget. What he's done for me. What he's done for me. What he's done for me, I never shall forget. I never shall forget. Never shall forget. What he's done for me, he saved my soul. Jesus saved my soul. I never shall forget. I never shall forget. Never shall forget. Never shall forget. What he's done for me. He brought me out. Jesus brought me out. I never shall forget. I never shall forget. I never shall forget what he's done for me. Never shall forget what he's done for me. How he loosed my shackles. 
shackles and he set me free. Never shall forget what he's done for me. How he lose my shackles and he set me free. Never shall forget what he done for me. How he lose my shackles and he set me free. Never shall forget what he done for me. How he lose my shackles and he set me free. Never shall forget what he done for me. How he lose my shackles and he set me free. Never shall forget what he done for me. There's a lily in the valley, found it to be bright. Somebody found deliverance, yes they did. Somebody found God in the valley, in the valley. Whatever you need is in the valley. Jesus said he will provide all you need in the valley. So I'm coming now. I'm coming now. I'm coming now. I'm coming now. David said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Thou 
thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me, they comfort me, he comforts me, I'm coming now, I'm coming now, I'm coming now. Amen, amen. Nothing like uh, men of God singing praise unto the Lord. Amen. Let's give God another hand clap of praise in the valley. I was listening to them, and when I think about that valley, I found all of that in the valley. Love and joy and peace and deliverance and uh, all of the above. Amen. God has a way of breaking you to bless you. Sometimes you can't understand and recognize your blessings till you've been broken. And, uh, and God has a way of taking us in the valley so he can take us back to the top. Amen. And I'm, I'm so thankful and grateful. And let me just help somebody. If you're a Christian, you're going to go in the valley. Amen. Amen. You can't, you can't stay at the top at all times. Uh, in fact, the valley is that place that educates you and prepares you for where God is propelling you. And so, uh, so you got to go through the valley. Go through As the a songwriter said, yea, though I walk through the valley and the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For his rod and his staff, they will bring comfort to me. Anybody ever found comfort through the rod and the staff? Amen. Amen. I, good to see so many out this morning. I'm grateful and thankful once again to God and to his son, our Savior, Jesus Christ and just the presence of his Holy Spirit. Is anyone happy today? Amen, just, just, just happy to be happy, amen. I'm just, amen. Nothing special has to happen, just happy to be happy, amen. I'm glad to be here, amen. I thank God for all of those who are laboring to set the atmosphere for worship this morning, our male course and music department, our ushers, those in audiovisual, and the greeters and all those who are literally laboring this morning so that you can feel welcome here at First Baptist Church. And I want to personally welcome all of, not only of our first time uh, guests and visitors, but all of you who have been returning visitors and uh, all of our members, we welcome you. And we want to thank God and welcome all those who are streaming live and who are joining us by live streaming. We thank you today and those who will be joining us by way of radio, we welcome you as well. There is a word from the Lord today as we continue our series for the year and our theme for the year and that is preparing yourself for the prophetic shift of Christ's return. As we've been talking about on Wednesdays, you gotta recognize the enemy so that you can know how to deal with the enemy. And uh, so we're encouraging you to come out on a regular basis and I'm believing God for increase in every area of our lives, especially when it comes to winning new souls to Christ. I think the greatest thing that you can give Christ besides yourself is the life or to uh, uh, introduce someone else uh, to Christ Jesus as Lord. Amen. Uh, so every Christian is called to be a part of that harvest gathering and planting those seeds so that Christ will have a harvest at his return. So with that thought in mind, I want to invite you to John, the 15th chapter of the Gospel of John, and uh, I want to just look at verse 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Amen. Taking your Bible in your hand. This book is the Word of God. It was written with me in mind. It has the power to change my life. I have the power to receive it or reject it. What I do with it determines what it can do in me. It is God's gift to me for the abundant life. 
Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. And as I always say, don't just say it, believe it and live it. Amen. I'm a firm believer that we were not born again to be defeated day by day. I believe God has given us victory over every situation in our lives. But if you don't connect yourself and do the things that are necessary according to the word, you can literally go to heaven and live like you're in hell on earth. Amen. And so looking at this passage of scripture, I want to ask a question today. As we look at that text again, it says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. My question to you today is, are you a fruit bearer for Jesus Christ? Are you a fruit bearer for Jesus Christ? In this particular passage of scripture, as we get to this point in Jesus' life, he has already had the Passover supper with his disciples. He has already mentioned that one of his disciples will betray him, his closest associate Peter would deny him, and the other apostles will forsake him. His heart is heavy. In fact, he says it in the Garden of Gethsemane that his heart was burdened down as he pondered over the assignment that God had given him. And let me just suggest to you today that if you are a child of God, you have an assignment that is not going to always be full of joy. It's a joy knowing that God has entrusted us to the assignment, but the assignment is not always joyful. His heart was heavy, his mind was disturbed. He's dealing with those things that we wrestle with in the flesh. And he cries out in the Garden of Gethsemane, I think somewhere around Luke 22 and 44, and he says, Father, if there's any other way, remove this cup from me, the cup of your wrath from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And Jesus, at this point, after having eating the supper with his disciples, washing their feet, preparing to go to the cross. He says in John 14, as his now disciples are disturbed at what he's been teaching them, he says, if you believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. In other words, I'm not going to build you a mansion, but for you to get where I am, I have to go through what I'm going through. I must needs bear this cross. I must needs be crucified. And I must be risen again so that you can come where I'm headed back to. And so he says in this text, as he looks at his disciples and he reiterates, it's, a, it's literally a summation of all that he's already said in John 15, when he says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you might go and bear fruit. In other words, I'm leaving you, but the assignment that I'm giving you as a Christian, as a believer, as an apostle, as a follower, as a disciple of Christ is not just to show up on a Sunday morning and look cute. I'm giving you the assignment of reaching souls for me. I want you to know that all that I've done was to set an example of what I am about. And just like I went through feeding the hungry and, and healing the sick and raising the dead and ministering to people and inviting them to come to me that they might receive salvation, that is your assignment. Your assignment is not just to get caught up in your denomination or your religion and to think that's all it is. I've given you the assignment of winning souls. I so love the world that God, my Father, gave his only Son, that whosoever might believe in him might uh, uh, not perish, but have everlasting life. My, my ultimate reason for coming into this world was to die so that souls might live, and that is your assignment. So that suggests to me that, that, that when we look at this text and we talk about uh, uh, being a fruit bearer, and the question is, are you bearing fruit for Christ? Are you just a Sunday morning worshiper? Are you just a week, uh, uh, from week to week worshiper? What kind of fruit do you have that gives evidence of your connection to Christ? Notice, if you will, in verse 1, Jesus says, I am the true vine. 
If he's the true vine, that's the implication. There must be some false vines. And there'll always be false religions. There'll always be false teachers. There'll always be false preachers. But that is no reason to become discouraged and to disconnect yourself from the true vine. Jesus says, I am the true vine. And my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it that it may bring forth much more fruit. If we're going to understand this ideal about fruit bearing, then we need to first understand the concept of bearing fruit in Jesus' name. Notice, if you will, Jesus says, I'm the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser, and every branch, somebody say every branch, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bring forth more fruit. In other words, the concept of bearing fruit in Jesus' name, first and foremost, is bearing fruit is not optional, it's obligatory for the disciple of Christ. Every one of us are called to bear fruit in the name of Jesus. We should not be satisfied with the numbers that we have just because we have good numbers. We are, you know, there are some churches that never grow because they become comfortable with where they are. And they like the people they're connected with and all they're thinking about in themselves. But God has called us to bear fruit. God says that we're to call forth the world and to bring the world and go into all the world. And so it's not an option. It's obligatory for every Christian to bring somebody to Christ. And you and I must ask the question, who is the last person that we have witnessed to that has given themselves to Christ? Because we are branches of the vine. And branches are the, those branches are the ones that bring forth the leaves and the fruit. And the question this morning is what kind of fruit are you bearing for Christ? And are you bearing any fruit for Christ? It's not an option. And there are some Christians who deceive themselves or allow themselves to be deceived by saying, well, that's not my forte. I, I, I'm not a person that witnessed to other people. That's not my personality. God didn't call you based on your personality. God called you based on his grace and his favor in your life, and you've got to deny your personality, step out of your shell, and tell somebody what the Lord has done for you. It is not option. It's an obligation. Every Christian is called to win somebody to Christ. Paul said it like this, that, that there are those who plant the seed, there are those who water the seed, but it's God that gives the increase. But every one of us ought to be at least a seed planter or one who waters the seed that somebody else has already planted. That says when a sinner comes into the path of a Christian, then that Christian has the obligation of planting a seed, and even if they don't see the fruit of that seed, somebody else will water that seed, and you won't know anything about it, but God will give the increase. And they may not necessarily join First Baptist. The goal is that they join Christ. But when we stand before God, every one of us ought to be able to stand saying, I know I've touched somebody. I think it's Matthew, the 25th chapter, when Jesus says he's going to separate the sheep from the goat. And what distinguishes the sheep from the goat is what the, the labors and the service that each one rendered. He says, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was in prison, you came to visit me. When I was sick, you, were, you came to visit me. And then he says to those, if you didn't do it, uh, then you didn't do it unto me. But if you did it, you did it unto me. Uh, so as you did it to the least of these, when you fed somebody, you were feeding me. When you helped somebody, you were helping me. When you clothed somebody, you were clothing me. When you came to visit the sick, you were visiting me. And that's what distinguishes the sheep from the goat. And the question again, as I reiterate it, what kind of fruit have you borne for Christ? Who can you say, I know I've testified to. And I know that they've been saved as a result of my witness. Bearing fruit is not optional. 
is obligatory for every true disciple of Christ. Jesus says, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes it away. Because if you're not bearing fruit, he's saying in essence, the branch is useless. Remember the fig tree in the story of Mark, the 11th chapter? The Bible says Jesus cursed the fig tree because it, it gave the appearance it was bearing fruit. But when he came to it, there was no fruit on it. And so he cursed the fruit, the tree, so that it could never bear fruit. And let me just suggest, you don't ever want God just to dismiss you to the point to where you're no longer usable in his service. He says in verse 3, you are already clean, uh, clean, in verse 2, I'm sorry, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it that it may bear more fruit. Now, I want you to notice that there are two types of fruit Jesus expects every Christian to bear. There are two types that every one of us are called to bear. Somebody say two types. Watch this. Number one, the fruit of Christian character and conduct. Every Christian who has been born again has the responsibility of bearing that kind of fruit, the fruit of Christian character and conduct. That is to say that when you get born again, a change ought to take place in your life and that change ought to be continuous. In other words, I say it all the time, Christ will receive you as you are, but he loves you too much to leave you as you are. So there ought to be some Christian and spiritual growth taking place in the life of every Christian. If you've only been saved one year, there ought to be some spiritual growth and maturity that is taking place in your life. And it ought to show up in your character and your conduct. In other words, if you were cussing folk out before you got saved, you ought to mature to the point to where you now refrain your tongue from saying things you want to say. If you were engaging in certain immoralities before you got saved, you ought to grow to a point to where you refrain and restrain yourself from putting yourself in positions that are detrimental uh, to your health and detrimental to your spiritual growth and development. So there ought to be a change in your conduct. In fact, let's look at 2 Corinthians 5.17. It says, if any person be in Christ, that person is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become brand new. So, so if you're in Christ, and what I've discovered as a, as a believer is there are a lot of people who are associated with Christ, but they're not in Christ. And this whole text that we're dealing with today deals with the fact of remaining in him and he remaining in us. And that's why he says 11 times, abide in me, abide in me. Abide in me. And if my words abide in you, why? Because it's, it's remaining in him that makes the difference. If anyone is in Christ, that person, man, woman, boy, or girl, is a new creature, old things. Now, I tell people all the time, I can still do some of the stuff that I used to do, but I don't have a desire for it because my new nature doesn't like what I used to do. And that old nature is always trying to rise up again, but because the new nature is present, I'm a new creature in Christ. Are there any new creatures in Christ? I'm a new creature. I'm not the same person I used to be. I may look the same on the outside, but something has happened on the inside that has transformed me. That's when the Holy Spirit comes into your life. And then it becomes my responsibility, according to the word of God, to take the word and transform the way I think. Because if you don't change the way you think, you won't change what you do. So if you keep thinking like you've always thought, you'll keep doing what you've always done, and you'll keep getting what you've always gotten. So to keep getting what you've always gotten and, keep, and to keep from doing what you've always done, you got to change the way you think. And you do that through the word of God. So, so the first fruit of Christian character is, is basically character and conduct. Look at Galatians, the fifth chapter. It talks about the fruits of the Spirit, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, Kindness, goodness, faithfulness. Verse 23, gentleness, self-control 
against such there is no law. So what does he say? Let's back up and look at that again. We're not going to spend much time on it, but look at the fruit of the Spirit. Somebody say the fruit of the Spirit. If you've got the Spirit in you, this is the kind of fruit that ought to show up in your character and your conduct. And, and what shows up in your character or in our character and our conduct is not contingent upon what other people do. So if other people don't love me, the spirit that's in me causes me to love those that don't love me. If things are falling apart in my life, the spirit of joy is still prevalent in my life. If chaos and confusion is surrounding me, then a peace that surpasses all understanding is still prevalent inside of me. When folk keep doing me wrong and I get tired of them, long suffering becomes the character and the conduct that I display. When people are nasty to me, then I return that nastiness with kindness. And when people have not helped me, in return, I be good and I, I strive to be good and help them despite what has happened to me. You see the fruit? Faithfulness. That says that when everybody else is falling away from the body, I draw closer to Christ and I get more committed, not less committed. Verse 23, gentleness. Learning how to deal with people, not only in love, but in a way that you know you don't want to break them. You know, some people say, well, I'm just telling the truth. You, sometimes you can tell the truth, but it's how you tell the truth. And some of us tell the truth not to help people, but to hurt people. Amen. And that's where the last one comes in, self-control. People say, well, I couldn't help it. The devil made me do it. The Bible says, if the Spirit of God lives in us, we can control our eyes. We can control what we hear. We can control what we say, and we can control what we do. Now, we may not always do it, but the scripture helps us understand you got the power to do it. That's why Ephesians 3 and 20 says our God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask, think, or imagine through the power that works in us. The power that works in us is that spirit that lives in us. So you have the ability to control yourself. And don't get me wrong, I know as Christians, why we're Christians and look good on Sunday morning, there are times when we desire and there are times when we do lose control. But that's not the character and the conduct that Jesus is saying we're supposed to display. The second kind of fruit is not only Christian character and conduct, but watch this, the fruit of the Christian conversion and commitment. Jesus is saying, not only should you bear that kind of fruit that is displayed in your personal life, but you ought to have the kind of fruit that says there are some leaves or some fruits as a result of me testifying to others what Christ has done for me. The, the great commission in Matthew 28 and 20 is to go into all the world. Now, you may not be able to travel around the world, but wherever you go, you ought to be a witness as to what the Lord has done for you. And there are some people say, well, I don't know the Bible that well. You don't have to know the Bible that well, but you ought to at least know what the Lord has done for you. Is there anybody in the house that can say, I don't know all the scripture from, from verse to verse, but I do know that it was the Lord that turned my life around. I do know that the Lord has changed me. I do know that the Lord gave me a new way of walking and a new, you got to tell your testimony. Psalm 1072 said, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. If God has rescued you from anything, then that's how you reach other people. In other words, if you were a drug addict and you get saved and you get born again, you can tell another drug addict that God is able to deliver you because what he's done for me, he's able to do for you. If you were an alcoholic, you can tell another alcoholic what God has done for me. You ain't got to use no verses. Just talk about what the Lord has done for you. There, 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 there's a, there's a, a, a group of women, and I can't remember where they are, but I remember seeing it on a, a documentary. There's a group of women that used to be uh, full-fledged prostitutes, and God delivered them. And God saved their lives. 
And so they, be, they have come together and they now have this mission that they go out on corners and they go where prostitutes are and they, and they witness to them. Not as those who are foreign to the lifestyle, but those who were born again from the lifestyle and they tell them, I stood where you stood, but God changed my life. Is there anybody in the house that has a testimony of what the Lord has done for you? The problem with some of us as Christians is that when we get saved, we don't want to tell nobody about the mess God brought us out of. So we sit up in here like we got halos over our head and act like we never done anything wrong and we criticize everybody else, but the truth is all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Some of us, some of us act like we never been young. I just had a service on yesterday and one of the senior citizens, and I'm not criticizing what she said, but she was supposed to do one thing and she got off into telling the young girls how they ought to dress. Telling them they need to wear the dresses below the knees. And, and she's at least 80. And my question is, why I don't disagree with what she might be saying, I wonder if she has forgotten when she was young. Talk to me somebody. We criticize the styles of our young people today. But in every generation, there are trends and fads that most of us get caught up in. We didn't sag our pants when I was coming up, but we did leave our belt loose open. I don't know why it was just going on in the neighborhood, so I did it. <laughs> Young, dumb, and stupid. Just following the crowd. I've had young people, it used to amaze me when I used to drive the bus, some of the kids didn't understand this. Said, I used to have two goals in my mouth. And the reason I got gold in my mouth at 17 is because that was what was happening in the era that I grew up in. So if you wanted to be somebody, if you want to be cool, if you want to be all of that and be recognized, you put some gold in your mouth. So not only do you glitter with your body, you glitter with your teeth. <laughs> Now, now watch this. I had one taken out, but the other one is still there. And I forget it because I'm almost 60 and it's been there since I was 17. But it's a reminder of where I come from. I've had people ask me as a pastor, why don't you just take it out? It reminds me of where God brought me from. It reminds me of what the Lord has done for me in my life. And while I forget it there, every time somebody asks me about it, it's a reminder that God is still able. You ain't got to know every scripture. You ain't got to be able to go from Genesis to Revelation. Just tell somebody what the Lord has done for you. Is there anybody in the house that has a testimony of what the Lord has done for you? I fall prayer, you say he picked me up, turned me around, placed my feet, on higher ground. Well, that was their testimony, but you ought to have a testimony. Some of y'all were incarcerated. God brought you out. Some of y'all were promiscuous, but God brought you out. Some of y'all were thieves, but God brought you out. Some of y'all were liars, still lying, but God's bringing you out. Amen. <laughs> God is able, somebody say he's able today. God is able to deliver those who will become a part of the vine. And Jesus says there ought to be two types of fruit you bear. The fruit of Christian character and conduct, but then secondly, the fruit of Christian conversion and commitment. Watch Acts 2 and 40, watch this. Acts 2, 40 and 41. Because it gives us a picture of the first century church. And with many other words, notice that, he testified. See, the reason some folk are not coming to Christ, some of us are not testifying. But if you tell somebody, and let me help somebody, don't go by what folk look like. You don't know what somebody's dealing with inside of them. 
some of the stuff, some of the things, when people put tattoos all over body, that says they're struggling internally with something. That they're, not, they're not doing that because they don't want to be bothered. They're doing it because they are bothered. And they need somebody that can tell them that there's something that money can't buy. That's something that a man-made image can't do for you. He said, with many other words, he testified and didn't condemn them, but exhorted them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. And watch what happens when that happens. Then those, which means everybody now is going to receive it. So don't be discouraged if you don't see the fruits immediately. But those who gladly received his word, watch what happened. They were baptized. They became identified with the body of Christ and Christ himself. And that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. And you know what happens when we testify? When we start telling our stories, others begin to say, well, I can't really believe the Bible. I knew you when you were out there. And I've seen the change in your life. And if God can do it for you, God can, come on, talk to me somebody. Somebody said like this, we are, in some cases, we're the only Bible or the first Bible some folk would ever read. So be careful how you conduct yourself in the house and outside the house. Because what goes on the inside will show up on the outside. So the concept of bearing fruit in Jesus' name is, is that bearing fruit is not optional. It is an obligation for every true disciple of Jesus Christ because the disciple is one who hears from his master or her master and then imitates what they've learned from the master. The two types of fruit, the fruit of Christian character and conduct, and then the fruit of a Christian conversion and commitment. And that is to say every one of us ought to not only be committed to Christ and serving the Lord inside the house, but we ought to be committed to sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with others outside the house. I always say coming in here is to get equipped, to get revived, to get re uh, regenerated, or not regenerated, but to be restored with our joy and all the things that have held us captive throughout the week, and then go back out there to the real world and real work. So, so the concept of bearing fruit in Jesus' name, but watch this, the criteria for bearing fruit in Jesus' name. Notice, if you will, in verse 3, he says, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in me, or in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. And he goes on to talk about that. He says, I am the vine, and you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, uh, bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they are gathered them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. And if you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will you be my disciples. What is the criteria for bearing fruit? In Jesus name. Notice the first thing that Jesus says in this text is that you must be properly connected to the vine. There are a lot of people who are connected to their denominations, but they're not necessarily connected to the vine. You have to be personally and properly connected to the vine as a branch. And notice if you will that it says right there in verse 3 he says, abide in me and I in you. The Greek word for abide just simply means to remain. That is to say, once you connect with me, don't allow the trials, the troubles, the tribulations, or the joys and the pleasures of life to sever you or to cause you to separate yourself from me. Stay connected to me. Then the question is, how do we get connected? Because if you're going to get connected, you've got to understand that Jesus says, first of all, if you're going to get connected, you've got to understand it's not a vine you connect to, it's the vine you connect to. In John 14 and 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. So I'm the vine. There's a lot of people on Facebook and social media and other places that are saying now that Jesus is not the way. But I declare not only by the word of God, but by my own personal experience that Christ is the way and there is no other way. None. 
So I've been telling folk, and when I go do my prison ministries, I tell them, I say, even if somebody could convince me that the Bible is not true, I cannot deny my personal experience. I know what the Lord has done for me. I know who brought me out. I know who changed my life. I know who turned me around. I know who gave me a new way of walking. So no matter what anybody else says, I know what the Lord has done for me. Does anybody in here know what he's done for you? I ain't just talking about on a Sunday morning. I'm talking about when you were changed. Transformation took place in your life. And I tell you, when you know you changed, folk who knew you think you're crazy. Because they can't figure thing out. They, they're like, what happened to him? But I tell you what happened. I had an encounter with Christ. I, I heard about him, but I never had an encounter with him. I, had, I heard folk preach about him, and I heard them talk about him. But when I met him for myself, you got to be connected to the vine. Bible says in Acts 4 and 12, there is no other name under heaven whereby men can be saved, but at the name of Jesus Christ. Have you not noticed that in the world that we live in currently and presently that people don't mind saying God, and I do believe God the Father is God, but God could be anybody based on man's definition. And so they avoid, they avoid saying the name of Jesus Christ. You can say God because that could be anybody, but you can't say the name of Jesus. Why? Because the world is afraid of the name of Jesus. Demons tremble at the name of Jesus. Healing takes place at the name of Jesus. There's deliverance at the name of Jesus. Alcoholics are set free at the name of Jesus. There's power in the name of Jesus. Anybody ever called him? In the name of Jesus. I rebuke you, Satan. In the name of Jesus. You got to talk to him. When that devil rises up against you, you ain't got to run from him. You stand flat-footed and you say, devil, in the name of Jesus. Anybody ever called him like that? Don't just say it because you heard me. You got to believe that thing. In the name of Jesus, I will get up again. In the name of Jesus, I will come out of this situation. In the name of Jesus, my family will be restored. In the name of Jesus, healing will take place in my body. In the name of Jesus, I will get another job. In the name of Jesus. You gotta say it. You gotta believe it. And you gotta receive it. Even before you can see the results. There's power in the name of Jesus. You got to be properly, properly connected to the vine. How does that happen? Well, Romans 10 and 9, if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised Christ from the dead, you shall be saved. You got folk out here teaching, you got to do something to be saved. Yes, you got to repent. Yes, you got to confess. But Christ did the work for you. He did it for you. You can't be religious and be righteous. Your righteousness comes through grace and faith. I just want to ask somebody, do you believe? You're saved. You still struggle at times, but you know you're saved. You fall short of his glory at times, but you know you're saved. Is there anybody in the house that knows I made that confession? I believe in my heart and I know I'm saved. You must be properly connected to the vine. Let me hear it as I close. Got about 10 minutes. <laughs> the biblical definition of 10 minutes. <laughs> but watch this. Notice what Jesus says in verse 3. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. How do we become 
Fruit bearers, and what is the criteria? Not only must you be properly connected to the vine, you must be cleansed through the vine. One of the reasons many of us are struggling in so many areas of our lives is we continually allow ourselves to be separated from the vine. It's through the vine that you get your nutrients, the minerals and everything you need to be a healthy branch. And what happens to a branch when it falls from the tree, while it may fall from the tree and the, green, the leaves are green when it falls, or the fruit is fresh when it falls, when it stays disconnected, it eventually dies. And that's what happens to people. And that's why they say if you stay out of the house of worship for 30 days, you become a prey for the enemy, and eventually you don't die. You just die. Whereas you may have gotten out for one good reason, but now you can't come back, although you don't have a reason. Because Satan wants you to die spiritually. He wants to keep you out there where he can destroy you. And that's why the scripture says you can't allow that to happen to you. You must be personally cleansed. What does that mean? The word washes us. See, none of us are perfected at this point. But the Word of God washes us. Now, what does that mean? In John 1 and 1, it says that, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was speaking of Christ. And so when we get into the Word, notice what he says, if you abide in me, and you remain in me, and my words remain in you, then what happens is, as we remain in Christ, and his word remains in us, his word washes out that filth and that dirt that was a part of our sinful nature. But when we get so caught up in everything else and we don't spend time reading the word and we don't spend time getting into the word and letting the word get in us, we're saved going to heaven, but we're dirty going to heaven. The word will cleanse you. The word will purify your mind. The word will help you to refrain your tongue. The word will help you to see things differently in life. It's the word that cleanses us. And that's why David said in Psalm 51 and 2, wash me thoroughly with your word. Cleanse me, purify me with his sop. And I will suggest if you've sinned and come short of the glory of God, don't just leave the church but find a quiet place, get on your knees, and say, wash me. Won't he wash you? Songwriter said in the past, he'll make you clean inside. He'll wash that stuff out of you. He'll purge that old person out of you. But you gotta stay connected to him. You can't just get it on Sunday morning. You got to get it every day. You got to let that stuff work in you and generate in you. Get saturated with it. And it starts purging it. And all that stuff comes out of you. And then you start putting that word back in you. And when you put that new word back in you, as you purge that old stuff out of you, you start smiling when others are frowning. You start being kind. You start showing love. You become gentle when you used to be harsh. And be, I mean, it just everything begins to change. And folks start wondering, so I can see a difference in your life. And you don't even realize it, but you've been changed. God will change you. I know that for myself. And those areas that you used to be weak in are the weakest in. He will allow you to be tested and you'll prove that you've been changed. Because they're not going to hold you captive like they did before. And so you must be personally cleansed through the vine. Look at Ephesians and we're done with that. We're going to move on to the last one. You must be personally cleansed. Ephesians 5 and 25. Let's turn it quick. I want them to see this one. Husbands. I meant 26, I'm sorry, no. Uh, watch this. Husbands, love your wives. Now, he's not, we're going to talk about that next week, Lord willing, about love. Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Verse 26. That he might sanctify, that set apart, speaking of the church, and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. How does God cleanse us? Through the word. And what happens when he starts cleansing us through the word? That he might present her to himself a glorious church, 
not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she should be holy and without blemish. Here's what Satan says. You too tired to go to Bible study. But what Satan is trying to tell you, stay dirty. Because he understands that the more word you get, the more you're going to become sanctified and set aside for his glory and for his honor. And what happens is it purifies you and you become that person without spot or wrinkle. That's the church Christ is coming back for. And you want to make sure that you're, you've got that cleansing agent, the word of God. I think it's in Psalm, what is it, Psalm 119 and, and, and 9. It says, how shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed to the word of God. In Psalm 119, 105, it says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my pathway. In other words, it's the word that cleanses us. And the only reason we live as good as we do, it's not because of our goodness, but it's because of the word that purifies us. Your hope is in the word. Your help is in the word. Your happiness is in the word. Your health is in the word. You must be properly connected to the vine. You must be personally cleansed through the vine. You must be persistent in continuing your correlation to the vine. Notice what Jesus says in verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered and gather them and throw them into the fire they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you will. That means you got to continually correlate and stay connected to the vine and then commune with the vine. That's to say there ought to be some constant Communion. That's why the Bible says in Hebrews 10, 25, fail not to assemble yourselves as the manner of some is. But the more you see us getting closer to the end, our theme for the year, he says come closer to Christ, don't go farther away. Why? Because social media and everything else is designed to pull you away from God. Nothing wrong with it. There's some good in it. But too much of it is detrimental to your spiritual growth and development. He says, as you see the world drawing away from me, you get closer to me because those are the ones that's going back to, with me. So he says here, you got to be persistent in continuing your correlation with Christ and other believers. And I tell people, if you want to stay strong, find somebody in the faith that's as strong or stronger than you. Quit running around with folk who are pulling you down, who are always negative who are not going in the direction you're trying to go into. You got to correlate and be connected with Christ and those who are going in the way that you're trying to get to. And then you got to commune with the vine. That's to say you got to talk to God. You got to have continual communion and conversation with God. You got to learn how to talk to him, not when you feel good. But I've learned to talk to him even when I don't feel good. I try to talk to him when I don't even have anything to talk about. Why? Because I understand that I'm struggling in this flesh, and there are times I just need to cry out and say, Lord, have mercy. Anybody else didn't, have, didn't know the words to say, you just had to cry out and say, Lord, have mercy. You know what I'm going through. You know what I've been experiencing. You know my struggles. God, have mercy on me. He says, if you ask anything, when you connect it to me, the desires of your heart will be granted. There's power in prayer. And that's why I said earlier when we were praying, you got to believe what you're praying. And believe that when you pray, you receive it before you see it. You got to believe in the power of prayer. Because prayer still works. Now y'all act like y'all don't know what I'm talking about. I said prayer still works. Ah. It may not work as far as we can see overnight. But if you keep on believing, if you keep on trusting, if you keep on praying, prayer still works. I heard about it when I was a child. Mama prayed over me. Granddaddy prayed over me. Daddy may have prayed over me. And I didn't come to it. But prayer still works. Somebody else was praying. Sunday school teachers pray. Preacher may have prayed. I still didn't come. But at the appointed time, I stand today to say prayer still works. 
Don't stop praying over your children. Don't stop praying over your family. Don't stop praying over your situation. Prayer still works. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. I'm a product of somebody's prayer. I'm a product of somebody praying for me. Is there anybody in the house that knows you're here today because somebody prayed for you? Mama prayed, daddy prayed, but somebody pray for me. I'm so glad, I'm so glad that somebody prayed for me. But then watch this, fruit bearing reveals and confirms our relationship to Christ and the Father. I'm almost done in verse eight. By this, my Father is glorified, that you may bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. That is the commission to bear fruit in Jesus' name, gives evidence of Christ's lordship over our lives as his disciples. He says, if you abide in me, and my words abide in you, that's evidence that you belong to me, and I belong to you. I think it's in this same gospel in John 14 and 23, when Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. In verse 22, he says, those that don't love me do not keep my commandments. So how do we know if we love him? Not by what we say, but by what we do. But he says here that when you keep his commandments, when you are commissioned to bear fruit in Jesus' name, it gives evidence of whom you belong to. I don't know about you, but I know I've been saved. And I know that the Lord is the head of my life. I know God is my father. I have no doubt about it. I am saved. And the evidence is, he is keeping me, even when I can't keep myself. But then watch this as I close. It says not only does it give evidence of you being a disciple, but he says, by this my Father is glorified. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that wherever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it unto you. These things I command you, that you love one another. By this, my Father is glorified. The word glorified in this text comes from an original word that means to celebrate with praise, worship, and adoration. It simply says that when we do it God's way, we're not just praising God when we stand up holding hands. That is a form of praise and worship. But he says, when my word abide in you, and, and you abide in my word, what happens is you're praising God everywhere you go. It's a form of praise, worship, and adoration. I think it was Paul the Apostle that said it in 2 Corinthians, the 8th chapter, if I'm not uh, mistaken. But it says basically that when we give, what happens is when we give to those who may not even know Christ, it redounds to thanksgiving unto God. That is to say we may have been the persons who put it in their hand, but when we walk away, they give glory to God. And sometimes when we think of praise, worship, and honor, our adoration, we're only thinking about it from the perspective when we do it. But I stop by to tell you that when the Word abides in you, and you abide in the Word of God, as you live your life from day to day, and from week to week, and from month to month, and from year to year, others will begin to worship him as a result of what they have received from your life. Every time you help somebody, you help somebody to praise God. Every time you give to somebody, you give somebody a reason to praise God. I just wonder if there's anybody in the house today that's been a blessing to somebody else, and because of you being a blessing, they have blessed the name of our God. I don't know about you, but I've come to worship him today. I've come to praise him. But watch this, and I'm done. Even if they don't praise him, I will still praise him. If they don't wave their hands, I'll still wave my hands. 
If they don't open their mouths, I still open my mouth. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praises shall continually be in my mouth. I can't forget about how he died for me. I cannot forget about how he was crucified for me. I cannot forget how they hung him between two thieves. I cannot forget how they mocked him and wagged their heads at him and called him everything but a child of God. I cannot forget how he was gone and put in that grave, how they put a rock over the rock. But on Sunday morning, three days later, the Bible said he got up with all power in his hands. Is there anybody that's willing to praise him? Come on, praise him. Bless him, worship him, adore him. He's worthy to be praised. Magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. For he's worth our worship. Let us pray. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus that you have called us to be fruit bearers in our character, in our conduct, by commissioning us to go forth and to help others receive conversion and commitment in Christ. We pray, God, that your word will live and sink deeply in our hearts. Let it abide in us. And then help us to abide in you so that we can ask what we will and have the assurance of knowing it shall be done. God, we praise you and we bless you. And we ask it in Jesus' name, our Lord and our Christ. And the church says, amen. As we stand, we want to extend an invitation to those who might be present today. If you've never accepted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, as the mail course leads us in a song of invitation, we encourage you to come. Those streaming live, if you've never accepted Christ, give your life to Christ right, right, right where you are. The Bible says if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, if you believe in your heart that God has raised Christ from the dead, you shall be saved. You can't save yourself. You can't live good enough to please God. It's too hard. You need the help of Christ. And if you don't have a personal relationship with him, if you've never given your life to him, I want you to be bold enough and courageous enough to come today. Would you be honest enough with yourself and with God to say, God, I want to be saved. I want to be that branch that's connected to the vine. I want to become a, a fruit bearer for Christ. If that's you today, would you come? Maybe you want to rededicate your life. Maybe you're that, that branch that was severed. You're not completely falling off, but you've been severed and you've not gotten all the nutrients and, and the minerals and the, the things that God has in store for you. If that's you, would you come today? God, I just want to be restored. I just want to be reconnected. I want to become everything you want me to become. If that's you today, would you come? Maybe you don't have a church home here today. You're already saved, you're rightly connected, but you just don't have a church family to call your own. If you're here today and you would love to become a part of our church family, we would love to have you. Would you come by faith? Would you follow the spirit of the Lord? Trust him with your salvation. Trust him with the growth of your daily life. Why don't you come? Maybe you need somebody to pray with you, pray for you. Is there one? Is there one? Our last call. God wants to use it. And he will use you if you allow it. But you got to make that step of faith. You can't be afraid. You can't be fearful of what others may say or what you're thinking. You got to walk by faith, not by sight. Just ask him. He'll do it for you. Touch my heart, Lord, speak to me. Yes, Lord. And we thank God there's none who have come, but the, there's always room for one or more. 
At this time, as we prepare to depart, we want to thank each and every one of you for coming out again. I trust and pray that there was enough in the word that you can take out this week and live by it. Amen. Bear fruit. Don't be afraid to witness the strangers. When people have started a conversation with you, ask God, is this opportunity for me to share the gospel? Or my testimony? There are ample opportunities out there for us to bear fruit. And God wants all of us to be fruit bearers. So let's determine within ourselves today we will bear fruit for Jesus Christ and for his kingdom. Amen. At this time, we're going to prepare to go not to our Sunday school classes, but we're going into the Family Life Center where we will have our ministry showcase. You will understand the kind of ministries that we have here at First Baptist Church. We're asking that you will go there and join us. If you don't have anything to do uh, that's of utmost importance, please join us and go down there and just look around for 15, 20 minutes. Uh, check out all the tables, check out all the ministries. See where God can connect you to the body of Christ. Every person ought to be connected doing something in, inside the house and outside the house. You ought to have a ministry within the church, the local church body, or the building, and you ought to have a ministry outside the building. But God wants you to be connected. So we're asking that you will go down there and please become a part of that. And we're so grateful if you do so. Also, if you wanted to become a part of our family or you wanted to get saved and didn't uh, come forth, there are some cards in the pews in front of you. You can fill those out. and Someone will uh, give them to the ushers. And someone will contact you based on the information that you place on the card. Thank you so much. I pray you have a wonderful week and a, a, a wonderful day this afternoon. It's a beautiful day that God has given us. And just enjoy life. Take the be make the best out of every moment. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Christ, for the privilege of being able to share this time together, to hear from you, and to share our love for you. We pray now, God, as we depart from this place, may we never depart from our, your presence. May you keep us in your perfect peace and prosper us in all of your ways. I pray, God, for every home and every heart that's represented here, for those that wanted to be here but couldn't be here, for those who are joining us by streaming live and those who are joining us by way of radio. Bless them, O oh God. Bless their home and bless all that's dear to them and cause your grace to be sufficient in every area of their lives. And now, God, unto him that is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before his throne with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, dominion, power, and majesty, both now and forever. Let the believing heart say, amen, amen. Please go down to the Family Life Center and uh, join us in 15, 20 minutes. Amen. God bless you.